Hey everyone, my name is Chad Myers, Community Manager here at Coursera, and I wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for joining us at our last data science webinar series that I like to call Data Bytes and Insights. It's the first of our monthly series that just started in January, and there will be more, so keep a lookout for that. Um, as it was our first time, there were a few bugs and issues, so I want to take a moment to address that and let you know that it will be improved for next month in February, and I appreciate all of the feedback that I have been given um, via the surveys if you're able to fill one out. And so since it was our first one, our guest's intro was cut out. So I'm going to read to you directly off of the flyer um, introducing our guests in the next following webinar. Um, Vinod is a data scientist here on the content strategy and enterprise teams where he designs experiments to drive product strategy, builds data products to improve the learning experience, and uses statistical modeling and machine learning to improve decision making. Prior to Coursera, he worked in the financial sector at Charles River Associates and Goldman Sachs. Vinod studied economics, statistics, and biology at UC Berkeley and Stanford. He is passionate about combining education and technology to create novel solutions that can address structural problems in the global economy. So, without further ado, here is a recording of our last webinar. Enjoy. Using machine learning? And then, for business and product intuition, this is really important and it's going to be something that is uh, underserved or not seen as, as important by people as those who focus on the technical skills. But, but at the end of the day, you're a data scientist in a company, you're gonna be working with a lot of non-technical people. Those are mostly gonna be your audience. And so you want to be able to communicate the work that you do to them in a way that they can understand. And since they don't know stats, they don't know programming generally, if you work with business people, you need to translate your technical stuff to non-technical language. So that's a really important thing that when you go through a lot of interviews, they're gonna kind of test you this by giving you case studies and then asking you to explain your results and conclusions in the context of the business in a way that a non-data scientist could understand. And this is especially relevant if you get to a lot of the final rounds of data scientist interviews when they bring you on site. Okay, so that's at a high level of like the different areas. So math, stats, programming, machine learning, business product intuition that you wanna know. And then depending on the type of data scientist you wanna be, what you should do is then like pick one of these areas to do a deep dive into, right? So if you're like super interested in working on causal inference and statistics problems, then you do a deep dive on statistics. If you're super interested in being a machine learning engineer, you'll deep dive on machine learning and deep dive probably on programming because you'll need programming to be able to deploy large machine learning models. So the idea is like you establish this broad base of skills across all the areas that you need and then you optimize for the type of data size that you want to be by deep diving on a specific area that gives you like the important in-depth knowledge to do the types of projects you want to do. So that's like basically the idea of how you want to tailor your training for data science. And then uh, once you sort of figure out the skills you want to do is then you want to just like build a portfolio of sample projects that show yourself utilizing those skills. Because a lot of what companies will do when they interview you, especially nowadays is they'll pre-screen you with like data tests. So they'll give you like a machine learning problem or like a stats problem or like a hypothesis, like testing experimental design problem and ask you to do it at home, right? And then they'll ask you to write up your results. And then when you go to the interview, they'll ask you about what you found and give you similar problems too. And so you wanna make sure you can sort of do this applied problem solving for the types of things uh, you wanna work on before you start doing the interviewing when you're doing your preparing. So hopefully that was, uh, a little bit of a nice helpful overview of like the types of things you'd want to learn and sort of how to best like orient your training for data science jobs. Uh, but as I said, if you go to answer the survey that Chad linked to in the chat and you enter an email address, I'll send you the slides that walks through this in more detail that way. Um, yeah, okay, so. So I think now, uh, I'm just responding to, yeah, so as I was saying, um, most of the pre-submitted questions fall into those categories. I think there's a couple other ones that were maybe more specific for individual people, which we will try to send out answers to after the session. But I think for now, I'll turn it over to the community for you guys to post questions into the chat message that we can talk about. Um, it seems like there's already one around, is there a good SQL course on Coursera? And so, yes, there is. We actually just launched a SQL for data science course that does a pretty good job of walking through the basics of SQL. And then at the end, actually does a SQL style uh, data science project. 
that will give you a sense of how data scientists might use SQL to solve problems that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. That course is by UC Irvine, and I believe it's called SQL for Data Science. So um, we can, I, I, um, I can link that through into the chat at some point. Um, okay, so there's a question around, uh, can you tell us your story, what you studied, what the interviewing was like? Um, I'm happy to do that. So in undergrad, I studied economics and then I went to grad school and studied stats. So I got a master's degree. I think the important thing to remember for uh, data science jobs is that you don't need a graduate degree. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a master's degree. Um, an undergraduate degree is good enough most of the time, even. Um, what's really important is the skill set you have and that you can prove to companies that you can solve the types of problems they want you to have you to work on. But for me, um, kind of going back to my story, I started out as I said, in economics, uh, transition to statistics for grad school. My previous work experience was in consulting. Um, so economic consulting, this is pretty much like working for like, you know, BCG, McKinsey, those kinds of companies that you think of. It was very like uh, business oriented and focused on uh, kind of like high level strategic analysis. So it was like very different than um, the kind of work you would see in data science, which tends to be more technical reliance, more on programming. But what I found, my, my, I found my economics uh, training was actually very helpful because a lot of the times in data science, the types of problems you want to solve are like, oh, this metric moved in this particular way. Can we understand why this metric moves and maybe like the after effects of this metric moving, right? So maybe like suddenly you'll see a bunch of traffic from like US people on the Coursera webpage and you'll want to understand, well, why are people suddenly coming there from the US, right? And so like you can approach this problem through like building a statistical model and like understanding what factors led to that increase. And so I think the types of problems that I solved in my undergraduate training actually transitioned well over to data science. And then when I went to grad school, I got a lot of the like extra tools and like machine learning uh, that I sort of needed to round out my skill set. Um, okay, so going to the next question I saw on the list. Uh, can you please repeat what those core skills are? So these are the five broad areas. Um, I won't repeat them here because we'll send out a, a slides after that have all the information on this. So just make sure to answer the survey and put your email address in the survey and we'll, we'll make sure you get that. Um, so what tool should we go to for visualization? So if we're talking about data visualization, I think the tool to use sort of depends on kind of how complicated the task you're dealing with is and then also kind of your language preference and tool set preference, right? So there's a lot of different data visualization tools out there that are specific for building charts and graphs, like things like Tableau, if you've heard of Looker, there's like BI intelligence tools that are built specifically for data visualization. I don't tend to use those as much um, because I personally prefer using R. And so I would use R to do all my uh, graphical analysis. So like the packages by Hadley Wickham, like ggplot2 are great visualization tools within R. Um, if you prefer Python, you will definitely want to learn matplotlib and seaborn. Those are probably the two most common visualization packages. But then even sometimes I'll end up using like, you know, Google, like the Google the Google version of Excel or Excel itself to make charts if I have like a super simple table of data and I just want to like make a quick graph to show to people. Um, a lot of times people prefer the way Google and Excel charts look, especially if you're presenting data to business people because that's the kind of thing they're familiar with. But again, it sort of depends on uh, what your preference is and how complicated a problem you is, you're, the problem you're trying to solve is. Because if you have a really complicated data set that needs to go through a lot of cleaning, you probably don't want to do the cleaning in Excel. You probably want to load the data into R or Python, do the cleaning, and then produce graphs off of that. Uh, data gathering, does that fall in the SQL category? I would say uh, definitely SQL involves a lot of data gathering because most of the time when you work for a company, what they do is they store their data in a SQL database. And so you'll need to write SQL queries to pull the data from the SQL database in order to gather it and then do analysis off of it. Um, but a lot of the times, you all the data you might need might not actually be in the SQL database, you might want to pull data from like third party sources, maybe like the web. So data gathering could also involve understanding how to scrape data from the web. So web scraping is another skill that 
can be useful. It's definitely not mandatory, but it's like a nice to have if you envision yourself doing like complicated analytical projects that pull data from third party sites and then you want to integrate that with the company's data. Um, I've had a couple of projects where that's been useful where I've had to go out onto the web and gather external data, for example, looking at like uh, salaries of different careers or like which careers are super popular for some of the work we've been doing. And so the web scraping skills were nice because I could then just go to a website, pull the data from the website that I wanted, like do some merging with an R to take the data set from Coursera that I wrote getting SQL and then merge it to the data scrape from the web to get a single data set that I could do analysis off of. Um, so there's a question around the types of projects that I work on currently. Um, so as of right now, I've shifted a lot of my work to trying to understand the impacts that Coursera classes have on the different audiences that we serve. So at Coursera, you know, our mission is to provide high quality access and education to everyone. And so we're really, uh, this is really important to us. And so we want to really understand, are we actually positively impacting people's lives through the courses we're offering? And so I've been doing a lot of survey design and uh, kind of like analysis of surveys to kind of capture this data and understand it. So that's like one group of projects I'm working on. The other set of projects I've been working on is around trying to understand people's motivations to have classes. So uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, the gender gap in like STEM, like, you know, there's a lot more men taking computer science on camp in college campuses than women taking computer science classes. And then we can sort of see the same pattern on Coursera, where if you look at the enrollment rates in data science and computer science classes, they tend to be a lot more men in those classes than women. And so it's trying to understand exactly why do we see that gap? Is it due to, you know, women being less interested in taking data science or is it due to you know them not having like the role models and female instructors and so it's trying to like disentangle all these different things and build off the literature in that area i would say those are two of like the main projects i'm currently working on but then i also do like you know our standard a b testing standard metric reporting that you'll sort of get in any data science jobs um, there's a question that's, what about using NoSQL? So I'll be honest, I'm not that familiar with NoSQL, um, but what I will say is, in, from what I can say is that generally for like the type of SQL language that you learn, it doesn't necessarily matter because like the syntax and everything is all the same. <coughs> I think you'll find a lot of companies will use like a MySQL database or a like Amazon Redshift data, uh, SQL database. So you'll just wanna make sure you learn like the, syntax for being able to write SQL queries to pull data from those different types of databases. Hopefully that helps with that question. Um, so which language is more demanding, Python or R or Java for data science? I will say that most data scientists, unless you're trying to do stuff in production, you probably won't use like a, what I'll say is like a real scripting language like Java or maybe even Scala. Um, just because those coding languages aren't really built for data science and they don't really have a data scientist community that maintains uh, useful packages and kind of uh, different packages that can do different models or things like that make data cleaning really easy. Like when I've used Java in the past, it would just be very hard to do a lot of the things that I do as a data scientist in Java, like running a regression would be pretty hard. Like pivoting a data set would be pretty hard. Like you don't really have a data structure for like a data frame, which is like the standard data science, uh, like data set that you would analyze. And so I would say that if you're looking to become a data scientist or break into data science, you'll want to know SQL for sure as far as programming goes, but then you really don't have to worry about like higher level languages like Java or Scala, unless <laughs> you really want to get into uh, really fancy machine learning models that are deployed in production and are like continuously updating with real-time data. What you should really focus on mastering is the basics of Python and R and the important packages within those two languages that are useful for data science, right? So for Python, it would be things like scikit-learn for all the statistics stuff. Uh, there's an NLP package whose name I'm blanking on within Python that's really useful for NLP stuff, but you want to make sure you learn that. I think it's like Jensen is one of them. Maybe NLTK is the other. Um, you know, you want, you, want, you want to know Pandas, NumPy, Seaborn, and Matlab, Matplotlib for the data visualization stuff we talked about. Um, 
with an R, you'll want to learn basically anything that had the Wickham rights is the state of the R packages that people use for data analysis and data science. So ggplot2, plyr, dplyr, um, all those packages. And so I, I really wouldn't worry about Java. I would focus on Python, R, and SQL. Uh, any hints how to progress more into the direction of computer vision with machine learning? So uh, to be honest, uh, this is an area that is definitely not my expertise. I come from more of like an economics and causal inference background, but I can shed a little bit of light on that. So if you look at a lot of computer vision problems today, they'll deal a lot with like pixel data and use a lot of like frontier techniques within deep learning. So if you want to get into computer vision and machine learning, uh, you should just work on becoming an expert in deep learning. And so like, you know, uh, Andrew's specialization, for example, is a great way to get started on that. And then you can sort of get more into, you know, more advanced types of deep learning uh, out there on the web and look at how people solve computer vision problems. You'll see they tend to use like conv convolutional neural nets, for example, so that I think that's the place you'll want to start if you if you already haven't started there. Uh, so there's a question on the base set of skills or topics represented from courses or side projects before deep diving. What would I say are the minimum skill sets topics? Um, yeah, I would say the list that's there is probably pretty right, but just to reiterate, it's basic programming within SQL, R, and Python. It's basic mathematics, so basic calculus, basic linear algebra. Uh, within statistics, you want to know hypothesis testing and you want to know regression, and probably basic experiment design as it relates to those things, so you can run A-B tests. Uh, a lot of the times, A-B tests tend to come up with interview questions. Uh, they'll ask you, like, can you design an experiment to test out uh, this, this thing that we're talking about? Um, and then the last grouping is what I'll call like business and product intuition. So you want to make sure you can translate your complicated technical statistical results into a language that non-technical people can understand. And this is, again, I want to emphasize this is a focus area that tends not to be emphasized as much with people when they're training to become data scientists. But if you think of the day-to-day -day job, what your job as a data scientist is to do is, you know, at one level, you're supposed to basically translate the technical work you do into a useful product feature or a useful insight can then benefit the company and in order to benefit the company people kind of have to understand what you're doing so you need to be able to translate uh, what you're doing to that non-technical audience um, okay so following up uh, does language matter I have seen C++ again I would emphasize that for most data scientists these like more complicated like computer science scripting languages like C++ C Scala Java aren't really the ones that people tend to use anymore um, for most data science jobs and most problems, R, Python, plus SQL is sufficient. Um, would GoodHub be a place where possible employers would look after the application before any next step in the application process? I, I will say that we actually, for example, when we recruit data science at Coursera, I think when we refer people or get applications from people, we give them an opportunity to paste the links to GitHub. And I think if you've done a lot of projects and you have like some code snippets or past code examples that you've done, you want to like a central place to store your portfolio, GitHub's definitely a good avenue to do that. I think one positive aspect of storing on GitHub is that you will also use GitHub and get a little bit familiar with its interface, which you know can only be helpful when you start a data science job because a lot of the times the code repositories for a lot of companies are on GitHub as well. So you'll end up having to commit code on GitHub and like code review on GitHub and all that stuff. So it's good to get familiar with it and it's probably a good place to also store your projects. And if you have a portfolio, even if the company doesn't ask you for it when you apply, I would definitely just submit it anyway. I've definitely done that in the past where I've applied to companies where all they ask for is my resume, but when I find someone at the company that I can email as like an individual person, I follow up with saying, hey, you know, here's a list of projects I worked on in the past that you know, show my ability to use these specific techniques that are useful in data science. And so I would highlight them uh, as necessary. Uh, so can you please explain a regular month, uh, what a regular month as a data scientist looks like? So I'll say that um, a regular month as a data scientist, it kind of varies sort of depending on where the business is and what the exact needs are. But I think in terms of like a day-to-day -day aspect, uh, I spend probably, you know, 10% of my day trying to think of how to solve specific problems, maybe 10% of my day like reporting on metrics for people, 10% of my day pulling data for people who don't know how to write SQL queries, maybe a good chunk of my day is also involved in like data cleaning. After I think of how to solve a problem, it's time to actually execute on it. So you need to like pull the data using SQL, you need to clean it, you need to prep it with an R to get ready to run the analysis. 
And then once you run the analysis, you need to interpret it. And then once you interpret it, you need to write it up. And then once you write it up, you need to share it out. So this involves talking to different people, uh, the stakeholders who would find the analysis relevant, um, getting feedback on it from other data scientists and improving on it, and then trying to kind of like create action or agency within the company around the insights you find and having them incorporate that into their decision making. So I would say like a typical day sort of involves all of those pieces of things. So it's a lot of you know, technical analysis, statistical modeling and coding, but at the same time, it's also a lot of talking to people in communication. And this is why being able to translate your technical findings to a non-technical audience is super important. Um, how do you normally reduce time for building databases of not structured data? So I would say what's nice about using a SQL database is that a SQL database provides an inherent structure on the data. And so, you know, because our, everything, every data that we collect through our Coursera product is stored into a SQL database, it already has a nice structure on it. So we don't really need to worry about building a database for non-structured data most of the time. I think one aspect you'll find is non-structured data will come from if you try to get data from third party sources. So as I mentioned previously, if you want to do like web scraping to pull data that isn't in your database that you think will be useful for your analysis, that data can then be unstructured a lot of the time. And so you'll have to figure out how to translate that unstructured data to the same structure as the data you would pull from the SQL database. But luckily, if you do web scraping with an R or Python, um, because you're scraping from the web and you're scraping from HTML, HTML data is typically decently structured. And so you'll just need to understand how to work with HTML data and translate that into a data frame. Um, and you know, with an R, for example, I don't know about Python, but with an R, for example, Hadley Wickham has a lot of great packages that will allow you to do web scraping and translate the HTML data to a data frame more easily. So I think uh, what's nice about the programming, pack, uh, programming languages that we talked about in terms of SQL, R, and Python is that uh, people have done a lot of investment in these different languages to make them easier for the type of work you would do in data science specifically. And so when you learn R or Python, you just want to make sure you're always up to date on the latest packages that are optimized for the type of problem you're trying to solve. Um, is it common for data science job applicants to do Kaggle competitions? Uh, yes, I think, you know, a lot of companies will even post Kaggle competitions with the promise of an interview to the people who are top performers on Kaggle competitions. I'll say one thing about Kaggle, though, is that Kaggle is very good for machine learning type problems. So if you want to become, you know, really good at machine learning, building, building those models, using those models to, like, derive insights or, like, build prediction output or recommend recommendation systems or things like that, like Kaggle's great for. What Kaggle won't prepare you for is more of what I'll call like decision scientist type problems. So these are things like experimental design, A-B testing, metrics tracking and reporting, um, kind of like statistical modeling, like hypothesis testing, and using regression for understanding drivers of different metrics or like trying to extract insights from data as opposed to just doing prediction. And so you won't get that from Kaggle. And so Kaggle isn't like, you know, Kaggle isn't going to prepare you, isn't going to necessarily give you that broad base of data science skills. But what Kaggle can do is it can give you more in-depth understanding of how to actually do machine learning and how to do programming as it relates to machine learning. So it's kind of like one aspect of data science that can be helpful and can be a good signal to employers if those are the types of problems that you're interested in working on. So, okay, so next question is, could you make a few examples of great data science projects to build an attractive data science portfolio? I'll say that, um, again, depending on the types of problems you wanna work on, you can choose different projects. So if you're really interested in machine learning, like you know, go ahead and do Kaggle. I think Kaggle's great. If you're interested in more of like the decision science stuff, so maybe like understanding what factors cause other factors, so like causal inference, or like more interested in like experimental design um, to like kind of measure the causal effect of something. For an example, like if you launch a new feature, you want to understand is that feature actually valuable or not? You would design an A-B test around the feature. So if you're interested in working on that type of stuff, I think you won't get that from Kaggle, but you can get that from doing your own projects. And I think these types of projects can be, you know, sort of anything involving data analysis that you're interested in. So as an example, in the past, um, I was interested in understanding do critics, you know, rate action movies more harshly than general people who go watch movies, right? This is like a random question I've been interested in, 
But if you think about how I would go about answering that question, the skills I would use are really similar to the skills that a decision data scientist would want to do, right? Because I have to go figure out the, the place to get the data from. I have to extract the data. So I probably like pull it from a database of movie reviews using web scraping. I'll have to clean the data using R or Python to get into a uh, suitable format for analysis. I'll have to build a regression model to measure out whether, um, you know, critics rate action movies harsher than normal people. And then I'll have to like interpret it. And then I'll have, and then what I can do is once I do all my analysis and interpret it, I can then write like a blog post or something that translates the complicated statistical findings to people for a non-technical audience, right? And so kind of going through all those steps, you'll see that we've touched on programming, we've touched on business and product intuition, we've touched on statistical modeling, maybe machine learning, depending on the type of problem you're doing. We've touched on communication with the written stuff. And so I think when you think about uh, attractive projects that you could use to build for a data science portfolio, I would just start with general questions you're interested in understanding and trying to answer using data, and then go and try and answer those questions using data. Figure out where you can get the data from, figure out how you have to clean the data, figure out the type of model you want to build, the type of analysis you want to do, and then write a blog post about it, write a, a, you know, a brief paper about it. <laughs> and then even talk about the project with your friends who maybe aren't, you know, technical people or data scientists and try and get them to understand what you did, right? And so by taking this unstructured problem from something you've been interested in, building structure around it, and then using the skills you would need for a data scientist to kind of go through all those things, uh, that really touches upon the full range of skills you would need to have for a data scientist because that way you're really starting from like bare bones, like product ideation down to the final analysis, which is the full spectrum of things you would be doing. So that would be um, my recommendation. Now the next question is, what are some simple projects for beginners to try on and not get overwhelmed by? Like I think if you try to do that full spectrum right away, it'll be a little bit daunting. Um, but you know, you can, you can do Kaggle. You can also just uh, look for you know, data sets online that people have done analysis on already. So you can try like data science blogs that people um, have written articles about where they've taken this unstructured problem and done all the lead work and you can try and replicate their analysis, right? And if you replicate their analysis, you can try and understand why did they make the decisions that they made at those specific individual points. And then as you replicate kind of people's analysis for a couple problems, you'll start to build the skill set to be able to do the whole thing yourself, right? And so that would be my recommendation there is just start with problems that people have already solved, replicate what they did. And then as you sort of get more experience, build more skill set, then go on to sort of doing the whole sort of funnel yourself starting from own, your own problems that you're interested in. Um, and I think a, a, another nice thing to get start off, started with is online courses, right? So if you look at Coursera classes, for example, on data science, a lot of them have peer review projects. And peer review projects are kind of a more structured format for what I've been talking about, where the peer review projects will give you a data set, give you a couple questions to try and answer, and then you'll fill in the details with your analysis and write a report that sort of summarizes it, right? So that's also a good place to get started on this there. Um, okay, so do you think that our studio and the ability to interweave stats, graphics, write-ups with something like R Markdown is where report writing is heading? Um, I, I will say yes, I'll be honest, because uh, you know, on a daily basis, what I do is I pull my data into our studio using SQL queries, I clean it, I do analysis, and then I write an R Markdown report that contains my findings with graphs and charts. I think R Markdown plus R Studio is just a really nice format to do analysis in because you can have your, all your code interweaved with all your text. And you know, when you wanna like update it, it's super simple because you can just rerun it and it will automatically pull in the new data from the SQL query, do the same cleaning, do the same analysis and give you the most up-to-date graphs and charts. So I think um, you'll definitely see a lot of data scientists doing reporting like this. And for the types of people who, you know, what they'll do for data science is try to extract insights from data and then tell people about the insights and what, they, what actions they should take based on those insights. Uh, this kind of report structure framework plus our studio is very, very useful. Um, do you think about tools such as data robot that are starting to automate parts of the data science process like cleaning and model fitting? I'm not super familiar with data robot, but I've seen a lot of companies that try to do a automation of a lot of the machine learning and data cleaning that people do. I will say that it's a little bit hard right now to automate a lot of the decision science stuff. So I mean, you can automate the rollout of experimentation, but it's a little bit hard to automate the design of experiments because a lot of the times there's 
little bit quirks that you need to worry about or customize for when building your experiment that you'll need to have to adjust for depending on like the exact product feature that you're talking about or anything. And a lot of the times when a metric moves, you can't really automate to figure out why did that metric move. You'll have to do a lot of custom analysis. So on the decision science side, I wouldn't say you can automate a lot of things. You can definitely have tools to make that process easier, right? So a lot of like, again, like Hadley Wickham has been like a godfather of this, like a lot of his packages in R can be said to maybe automate some of the data cleaning, but it's really just tools that make that process a lot easier and abstract away from some of the stuff that data scientists will have to do and speed it up that way. Um, in terms of automating machine learning, we're definitely seeing a lot of automation within companies and in startups, and you'll see a lot of companies basically automate parameter tuning. So like what you'll do maybe is just, you'll say like, oh, for this parameter, I think it's value should lie between like X and Y, and then you'll have an infrastructure that will run through uh, all the different models for all the different values of parameters, and then using cross-validation to pick out uh, the best sort of model with the best parameter value. I think because machine learning is sort of just like a gigantic optimization function, you can automate a lot of that. And you know, if you're interested in building infrastructure to do that automation as a data scientist, there's definitely a lot of opportunities there. Uh, what would you like to know about data when you get new data sets in most cases? I think the first thing I do when I get new data sets is I build visualizations. I think visualizations give you a good intuition for the underlying relationships in the data. So a lot of the times like you can do scatter plots to understand is there correlation between different variables that you think uh, might be interesting to look at. Um, I think beyond visualizations, you also just want to like look at the physical observations in the data, just make sure like nothing looks funky. Like if you have a numeric data, you just want to make sure it has like numerical values. Um, if you have currency data, sometimes like the dollar sign can cause it not to be interpreted as a number. So you want to double check is it interpreted as a number. So like I would, I would say like first is like basic sanity checks plus basic visualizations just to get a grasp of what relationships and types of data are within the data set I'm looking at. Um, What's the general process for working on a data analysis project? Any mistakes the new data science is easy to make? How to avoid these mistakes? I'll say that the general process is kind of what I alluded to before when trying to build projects for portfolios. So the idea is like figure out a problem you want to work on, figure out the data you need to tackle that uh, problem, then clean the data, then build a model for the data, then interpret the model, then write up your results. I think that's just the general process on a data analysis project that I work through, I think mistakes the new data scientists can make is that, you know, a lot of the times the gathering of the data and the cleaning of the data are not fun parts of the process. And so it can be super tempting to skip through all that stuff to just get to the modeling aspect and then just run with the model. I think a lot of the times you'll run into problems though where the data set, if you don't clean it properly or you don't actually look at it to examine the relationships, you can run into issues where your model can be misspecified or you'll have like the wrong data type for a specific variable that can then lead to insights that look like they might actually be something, but they're not real. And in fact, due to just the way you didn't clean the data properly or you specified the model too quickly to get to the exciting piece. So I think it's like really emphasizing that you wanna have a really good understanding of your data. You wanna make sure you clean it in the best way possible. And you wanna make sure that you're you have a really good understanding of the problem you're trying to solve and why the specific model you chose is a good solution for the problem you're trying to solve given all the assumptions and cleaning and issues that the data has, right? Because it's like very easy to just like run a regression problem, just run a machine learning problem and get output and just run with the output because that's all automated for you in the sense that all you have to do is like write a line of code to get the results, right? But then you want to make sure that the results make sense. You want to make sure that you clean the data appropriately and all that other stuff. So just like, you know, take the whole process, uh, take time through the whole process and don't like rush through to the end just to get to the exciting pieces. Uh, how and where did you get your programming skills? So I was lucky in that undergrad, I actually used R a lot in a lot of my classes. So I learned R through, you know, just doing that. I think, um, that, that introduced me to like the basics of our programming, but a, a lot of how I got, you know, more in depth skills within R was just like doing my own side projects. Like I would find a data set that I was interested in and I would find a problem I was interested in solving and I would go and get that data into R and then try and do stuff with it. And a lot of the times when you're trying to, you know, do data analysis on a new data set or solve a new novel problem that you found interesting, you'll have to learn new skills naturally because each data set is different. And so then kind of going through there, you can like Google out like, 
you know, what packages are useful in this context or for this type of model, and then you can build your programming skill set through that. I, 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 would, I would emphasize, like, you want to build your programming skill set through actually doing data science stuff as opposed to, like, taking, you know, like, just general programming classes for the most part, because at the end of the day, programming for a data scientist is really a tool to accomplish data analysis as opposed to a, a thing in and of itself. So you want to make sure you're learning, learning programming as it's useful to actually do things. Um, do you think there's a big difference between Python for data science and traditional Python? I would say, yeah, there probably is, especially because within data science for Python, you end up using a lot of specific packages that non-data scientists in Python probably won't use. And so I think, yeah, you definitely, there'll definitely be a difference because just by nature of the packages you're using. And I'll also say data scientists probably have a lower code quality standard than uh, actual programmers, so you can get away with kind of not learning best principles, although I guess I should say you should probably learn best principles anyway. Um, so in my bio, it's a, it emphasized that I studied biology. Do I have any biological data experience? What is my advice for genomic data science? Um, yeah, so I have some experience with biological data. I'll say that um, advice for genomic data science, I will say is that in genomic data science, you'll get very large data sets because you're talking about, you know, gene data for individual people and there's many different genes and, um, there's many different observations of people. So like, because the data sets are so large, programming becomes more important because you'll need to understand how to handle these really large data sets. So understanding how to use packages for things like sparse matrices or other things that can handle really large data sets and optimizing for that to make your code run faster is really important. And I think the other thing is that um, there's a lot of advances in machine learning recently within like biostatistics and genomic data science that solve for the problem where you have like, you know, your P is greater than your N or you have like more variables than you do individual observations and you can't do like standard regression models. And so you'll have to do like more complicated machine learning models. And so I think, you know, getting into machine learning for genomic data science is gonna be increasingly important. So, you know, techniques to handle large data sets plus, you know, knowledge of machine learning and like the, pro the relevant programming that uh, relates to those two are super important. And these are also good general principles for people, even if you aren't interested in, you know, uh, bi biological data, if you're interested in machine learning, you're going to end up having lots of large data sets. And so learning how to handle large data sets is actually really important and something I think people should <coughs> start to focus on if they want to get more into machine learning. Um, any good books you can refer for statistical modeling or data science basics? Um, I will say I am probably more of like a classical, like, person who likes looking at textbooks to learn things. So I've learned from like, you know, your standard like undergraduate statistics book. So there's a book by like John Rice that I really like for basic statistics. Uh, there's an econometrics book by like, uh, by Watt, by Mark and Watson. That's a good reference for econometrics. Um, I would say though, if you're trying to learn the basics, it's not clear to me that, you know, going through textbooks is the best case. Honestly, I would use a lot of the online course material out there just because it's a lot easier to kind of pick and choose within a course the exact topics you want to do and the nice thing about online courses is you kind of also get access to applied projects which i think is at the end of the day what you really want to end up focusing on because at the end of the day you're trying to learn how to do something as opposed to the theory um, so what data science skills did you already have before you started your job and what skills did i learn on the job I will say I had a good understanding of statistics, a good understanding of math, and a good understanding of machine learning before I joined, but my coding was pretty weak, mostly because I hadn't come from a computer science background. I hadn't like, you know, written code that was supposed to be readable for other people. And so I think my coding skills have improved a lot on the job. And then also my business and product intuition has improved a lot of the job, just as I've had to talk to lots of people about my findings as I found them. Uh, so what about Hadoop? Uh, so again, Hadoop is like one of those like data infrastructure packages that's like great for large data sets. So if you're interested in working with, you know, big data or interested in doing machine learning, I think, you know, you should end up learning about Hadoop and all those like large data set tooling. I will say like, I haven't had to deal ever with like data sets that were large enough such that I should use Hadoop. Um, so I haven't found it particularly useful. Again, I think it depends on the types of problems you want to work on and the type of data scientist you want to be, which the slides I will send out after this will kind of get into, but Hadoop isn't really relevant for every data scientist. 
Um, how many projects am I currently working on? I will say I probably am working on five or six projects right now. That might seem like a lot, but some of them are like long-term projects and some of them are short-term projects. And I think that's just generally how your project portfolio as a data scientist will kind of work out unless you optimize for a very specific area. So data scientists, of course, Sarah, tend to be kind of like generalists. So you sort of get pulled in all these different directions, like as I said, like metrics reporting, uh, you know, pulling data for people, building regression models to like derive insights from data, doing some machine learning. Um, so we kind of cover the gamut, but if you end up specializing on you know, a specific machine learning problem like building a recommendation system, or if you want to build like a data infrastructure, data scientist who builds tooling for data scientists, you might end up only working on one or two projects just because the scope of those projects will be a lot bigger that you won't have time to do other things. Um, so I'm getting, kind of getting lost in books, videos, and tutorials. Can you recommend a roadmap for those who've already had an overview about the basics? So if you've already had an overview about the basics and you have sort of a skill set in these like five different areas that I've talked about and you want to dive deeper, I think what you want to first start with is like figure out the deeper areas that you want to learn about, right? So is it like, is it big data tooling? Is it neural networks? Is it like text models for natural language processing, right? And then once you pick those topic areas, you can then, your search will sort of then be a lot easier because you can figure out is there an online course that teaches those things that I want to know. And I was sort of, I guess I'm sort of always optimizing for online courses just because I think they'll have projects and practice problems that are relevant. And they tend to be a lot shorter than going through an entire textbook. They'll cut out a lot of the fat. So it's a lot quicker to learn from an online course than probably going through a textbook. Um, you know, YouTube also has a lot of videos. There's a lot of blogs out there. So like Stack Overflow or people have data science blogs that maybe they've gone through some problems with these techniques that you can then try and replicate analysis for to learn the techniques as well. But I would start with a specific topic area that you want to learn. And then <clears throat> once you identify the topic area, then figure out what source is best for learning that topic area. And I think that should sort of reduce the scope of the problem. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'll vote for blog posting, talk more about it. So to be honest, I don't actually know people who have good data science blogs. Um, but I think the main thing I would point out for data science blogs, it's not like you should just read the blogs religiously because reading them is useful. I think it's more about if you find a blog where someone solves a problem using data science and posts their code, I think replicating their analysis is particularly useful because that will sort of give you practice in getting the skill sets. And so for that, it's sort of less important that you follow an individual person's blog. It's more just like, you know, uh, a great example for this is maybe 538, right? Like if you, if you guys have ever seen the website 538 by Nate Silver, he does a lot of like data journalism. So he, does, he takes a lot of data sets and does a lot of analysis on the data sets, right? You can imagine trying to replicate um, a 538 article and that would just be, you know, a good opportunity to practice the skills you would need to do as a data scientist. Uh, would you focus on in terms of programming slash statistical tools using only open source products? I will say yes, I would only mostly focus on using open source products. One, because when you're training, you probably don't want to pay for like a MATLAB subscription or SAS subscription. And two, uh, companies are tending to move towards these languages. And so a lot of the companies that hire a lot of data scientists will end up using Python or R. And if you're interviewing for a company that knows MATLAB, that they uses MATLAB or SAS, it's actually not that hard to translate the syntax with an R or Python to those other languages if you have to in order to uh, start doing that job. So I would say um, just learn, this, learn the tool that has the broadest applicability and broadest usefulness, which would be R or Python, and then you can worry about learning tools for specific jobs once you get there. Any thoughts on full workbenches like Wicca? So from what I understand, Wicca is like a thing that used to be used for machine learning, but it's mostly been replaced by R and Python now, especially because R and Python have packages that are optimized for machine learning models, right? Like R has a great package on random forests. It has, um, you know, like TensorFlow is now a new, new package that is optimized for deep learning. So I think R and Python and, you know, maybe some like add-on packages from like TensorFlow are really replacing the older um, data analysis tools. So how do the Coursera data science specialty metrics compare to the rest of Coursera portfolio? It seems like data science is a perfect match for the Coursera platform. 
Yeah, I'll say like, you know, we've seen a lot of increasing popularity within data science content on our Coursera platform. And I think it's because the field especially is really growing and there's a lot of opportunity within data science. And also I'll say like data skills in general are just becoming more and more important throughout the organization. Even non-technical people are starting to have to understand how to think about interpreting the experimental results or interpreting like maybe like a, some different graphs of data or like even a regression model. And so just general data awareness is becoming more and more important. And I think we're sort of seeing that in terms of demand for content on Coursera. If you are an NLP developer and feeling okay with convolutional neural networks, uh, long-term like sequence modeling, word embedding in Python and have developed functional tap bots, what more would you need for an NLP engineer? So, I mean, I'll say if you have all that skill set and you're familiar with those things, I think you just need to start interviewing and practice, uh, you know, doing interviews because it sounds like you have the basic, you have the basic skill set that you would need, right? Like, you know, the frontier techniques, you can code, um, you can develop these into actual projects signaled by like doing the chatbots. So just get out there and interview. Uh, what about commercial software like SaaS? Yeah, so one thing about SaaS is, and, and all these different languages, it depends on what kind of industry you wanna work on. So I'll say based on my past experience, if you wanna work for a lot of like large established companies or companies in healthcare, they'll tend to use SaaS. So if you're really set on doing like a, you know, doing pharmaceutical data science or working for like maybe a retailer, um, maybe you should think about looking into learning about SaaS. Um, that's, an, that's an opportunity to maybe get a leg up on some of the competition that hadn't learned it otherwise, but I'll say like, again, you can pick up SAS pretty easily if you know general data science and how to program in R and Python. SAS is a lot easier, usually. Um, and I'll say if like you're interested in finance, for example, a lot of finance companies tend to use MATLAB. So uh, maybe you should pick up MATLAB. You can learn Octave, which is a free version of MATLAB, but it's basically the same syntax. But again, like MATLAB is so similar to R and Python that if you learn R and Python, like especially R, you'll be able to pick up MATLAB very quickly. Uh, so if someone missed the genomic data part, uh, just the genomic data part, I would say for that, just to reiterate quickly, you want to learn uh, algorithms to deal with big data, so emphasizing programming skills and large data sets, and then also machine learning to handle large data sets. Do you think it helps to put projects in R you've done using R pubs? Yeah, I would say again, you want to build a portfolio. So like any relevant projects you've done, like just assemble them together. Your portfolio can be something as simple as a list of PDFs, PDF documents on your computer. That, that's how I store my portfolio because I hate GitHub. But if you want to build up a GitHub portfolio, feel free to put it on GitHub. If you want to store it on a publicly available site like RPubs, go ahead and do that. The important thing is not that you can share it to the World Wide Web. The important thing is that you can take your portfolio and share it with people once you start interviewing. So you can show companies that you have the applied skill set to solve the problems uh, that they're gonna give you. Um, how much math do we know, need to know to get into data science? So I would say like, um, if you're going through like a classical education, you'll end up picking a lot of math, but a lot of it at the end of the day isn't really that useful for the majority of the stuff you're trying to do. Sometimes the math is helpful if like, you're like, oh, I need to calculate standard errors for this like weird statistic I'm doing and I don't quite know how to do it. So I can look up online. If you have a good enough math map on, you can like read through people's technical derivations, but that's like very, <coughs> very rare that you will need to do that. And so for the math you need to know, I would say like basic calculus, when I say basic calculus, I mean like basic differentiation, maybe both you know single variable and multivariable differentiation so like understanding the chain rule um understanding like very basic in, uh optimizations like maximizing functions very basic integration and then you want to understand linear algebra so like how to do math with matrices you'll probably want to know like decompositions of matrices you want to know how linear algebra intersects with programming so how to program effectively using matrices but really beyond that set of core things oh and like algebra of course so like variables and things like that in addition to subtraction beyond that small set of math topics you don't really need to know much more math and it's much more important that you then just go and learn you know like the the specific statistic topics and machine learning topics and then uh that'll give you enough skill set to sort of understand at a high level what's going on in those areas and then if you find there's math that you're missing to understand the particular machine learning model you're talking about you can always go learn it later um, so I would say like minimize the amount of math you learn up front and focus on getting to the data science topics you want to learn about and then focus on once you get to the data science topics you want to learn about, focus on applying the skills and practical settings that you learn. Um, considering your work experience, what is the market for independent consultants with good data science skills? Um, I'll say that I would imagine the market's pretty strong, but 
I don't actually know how to become an independent consultant in data science. I've been fortunate through networking with you know, professors that I've worked with in the past that have given me these opportunities. And so I think it's gonna be very network dependent for demand for your particular skill set within uh, data science as an independent consultant. It's gonna really depend on who you know that can get you jobs to work for. Um, if you're looking to build a network, I would say maybe you wanna go and uh, go attend data science conferences, learn about different people working on different problems, talking to them about those problems and try and suggest how you can be helpful to them. That's probably the best advice I can give you at this point. Um, with my background in economics and my work experience, have I ever considered moving to the banking sector? Uh, so yeah, I actually used to work in finance um, before I came to Coursera. And I think I've always been interested in finance and I think a lot of the skill sets for data science are super useful for finance companies. And if you actually look at job postings within finance, you'll see a new type of position that's actually called data science emerging. And this is true at both quantitative and non-quantitative firms within the finance industry. Um, so if you're interested in data science in the finance sector, you can definitely start going and getting jobs there. I will say the emphasis for that set will be more on machine learning modeling and more on econometric techniques than probably other uh, areas of data science and other industries. So you want to make sure you know those two very well. And I'll say econometrics just because traditional finance theory uses a lot of econometrics for its estimation. So you want to make sure you read up on that and financial theory a little bit. Um, but your understanding of finance isn't necessarily as important as the programming and machine learning skill set that you bring. I'll say I left finance really quickly just because finance tends to be a very hierarchical industry. So I, I wanted to work at a place where I'd be given more independence. And I think, um, yeah, so that was one reason. And then two, I think I really uh, align with Coursera's mission. And so working for a company that has social impact was really important for me, which is why I transferred to Coursera. Okay, so what are my uh, DS role models? Uh, this is kind of lame, but I'll say my manager here at Coursera is actually one of my role models within data science. I think she is uh, a fantastically insightful person who has very strong business intuition. I always learn a lot from her on a daily basis. And so I, I wanna kind of, as I grow, become more like her in my skill set. I'll think, I, I think outside of Coursera, like Hadley Wickham is definitely a role model. His ability to build useful tooling for um, data scientist is something that's really amazing. I think his insight into like what to do to make tasks easier is really strong. I think one thing I didn't mention earlier is that as a data scientist, one thing you'll want to do is probably build tools for your audience to be able to interpret the data and analysis that you did. Um, so example, like I have actually built a lot of R Shiny apps to pull data and kind of like present it present plots and tables and clever ways to help people make decisions. And the R Shiny app is like, you know, automatically updating. So it's always showing you real time data. And so it's like very convenient framework for people who are non-technical to access and get uh, sort of get access to data they wouldn't have otherwise seen or insights they wouldn't have otherwise, uh, otherwise seen. And um, I've taken a lot of principles into designing those apps from what Hadley Wickham has done with his R packages. And so, you know, you want to abstract away as much complexity as possible. I think that's like one general principle that DS role models will teach you. Um, what attributes would you like to seek from a qualified candidate for data scientist? So if I was interviewing someone for data scientist, I would say, again, I want someone to have the broad skill set in the five categories I'm talking about. I would then want to see them be an expert in one of those areas or at least one of those areas so that they, they know a little bit about everything, but they're really good at one particular thing and can do that thing. And then uh, beyond the skill set, I would say I want to I would want to make sure they're like, you know, interested in solving challenging problems, interested in learning because, you know, you're not going to be able to know how to do everything as a data scientist. You're going to be able to need to talk to people and acquire new skills to make sure that they have that like growth mindset. And then I think the third thing is that, again, emphasizing one of the skill areas, are they able to communicate their findings in data science to a non-technical audience and to other people? Because if you can't translate the complicated work you do into easy to understand language, you're not going to be able to have an impact on the company you're working for. So that's one of the most important things that I would look for and that you will find companies actually test you on when you go on site. Um, how long will it take to learn data science using R and Python? It's hard to say because it sort of depends on your programming ability. Like if you're a really good programmer, picking up the syntax for R and Python should be super easy. If you're new to programming, <coughs> it'll probably take a month or two to just get down the basics with the syntax and I could really start to remember it and learn how to do basic data analysis and uh, data manipulation. So that's just maybe a guideline. Um, perspective related to the future of data science as a profession. I will say data science is definitely growing. I don't think it's a hype. I think um, as we collect more data and people try to make more sophisticated decision making and try and make data driven decisions, we're going to need more people who can do this analysis 
And then I think um, if we get more people doing the analysis, we're also going to need people throughout the company, not just data scientists to have data skills. And so like understanding of maybe basic data science would become even more important as it spreads throughout the company. So like marketing, for example, is going through a revolution where like, uh, like SEO and like digital marketing are like changing it. And so like understanding data and how to interpret trends and graphs are becoming more and more important in all marketing professions, not just data science. All right, everyone. Um, That's cool. time. Thank oh. you so much, Manad. You answered so many questions. Um, I appreciate that. I'm sure everyone did. Um, in the chat box, uh, I gave a link for everyone to look at the survey. And then in addition to that, um, post in the forums. And Vinod can check them. And then you guys continue insights. But uh, thank you so much, everyone. And Vinod, is there anything else you want to say in the concluding marks? I wanted to respect your time. It is uh, 1230 in the seminar for us here. Yeah, so I guess I would just say, like, you know, uh, I'll send out the, the slides to everyone, but, like, understand that you don't have to be an expert machine learning person to become a machine learning engineer. You just need to have a, a good skill set in the basics and then maybe a knowledge of some of the more advanced topics and prove to a company that you're able to, one, learn, and two, you have the skill set that can be built off of to actually, like, do the work, right? So, like, don't try to go out and learn like the hottest topic that everyone's doing within data science, right? Like even deep learning, for example, like you don't need to know deep learning to become a data scientist, right? Like most people who do data science won't actually use deep learning because you won't have large enough data sets or it's like too complicated a model for the type of problem you're solving. So really master the basics, really master the communication aspect, and then pick one area you want to do a deep dive of and just like go there and just like go out and do apply projects, go out and practice these skill sets and just like get practical experience and then when you start interviewing to companies they're going to be impressed by all the things you can actually do all right awesome thank you so much you guys thank you so much vanad and then um i will see everybody next month with our next guest so uh have a great weekend and uh see everyone soon cool thank you everyone